The following program is a color feature presentation on the HSN Television Network. This Week in Pro Football is brought to you by Hager Slacks. They just fit better naturally. And by American Motors and your local American Motors dealer. Hi, I'm Pat Summerall. And I'm Tom Brookshire. This week in the first half of our show, we'll see how the Pittsburgh Steelers and the New York Giants earned their first wins. I think you warned me about that one, Pat. I did. We'll also see how the Kansas City Chiefs and the Oakland Raiders bounce back in the AFC West. We'll see how Paul Brown's return to Cleveland almost did in the Browns. And we'll see the Minnesota defense carry the Vikings to a first-place tie in the NFC Central Division. We'll see all of these games and more right after this message. At Wrigley Field in Chicago, quarterback Jack Concannon, number 11, had grandiose plans for dealing with the Vikings. Unfortunately for the Bears, execution of these plays was another matter. Too often, Chicago faltered when their chance came. Too often, they drop passes that had easy touchdown written all over them. Perhaps Chicago was too busy thinking about the Purple Punishers to concentrate on carrying out their game plan. Every time Jack Concannon would breathe a spark of life into them, the Bears would somehow manage to douse it themselves. Minnesota's Gary Larson, number 77, recovered this fumble. And from there, it was all Clint Jones, number 26. Even a bear avalanche could not stop the high-balling Jones. And on this play, his great second effort was rewarded by seven points. Then it was back to the Lavender Hill mob, led by a master thief named Alan Page. Mm -hmm. 
Once he had the ball, he was off and running, and not even Gale Sayers could catch him. While the Vikings had their Butch Cassidy in the person of Alan Page, the Bears had Ed Obradovich, number 87. He scooped up the ball and took off on a fairly decent impersonation of the Sundance Kid. But the play was ruled as an incompleted pass, and at least one referee was glad Obradovich wasn't wearing a tearaway jersey. Finally, it was number 15, Gary Quazzo to Gene Washington on a 49-yard streak. And the Vikings had a piece of first place in the NFC Central Division, as well as their second shutout of the year, 24 to nothing. In Cleveland, Coach Blanton Collier seemed relaxed as he prepared for the first contest in what promises to be a fierce rivalry with Coach Paul Brown and the Cincinnati Bengals. From the very outset, it was obvious to over 83,000 fans present that when these two clubs meet, the game will never be termed ordinary. The Bengals drew first blood on a 50-yard field goal. Then Virgil Carter, number 11, threw to Erie Crabtree, who recovered his own fumble and set up a two-yard touchdown dive by number 30, Jess Phillips. Ben goes 10, the Browns nothing. But not for long, as Cleveland's number 71, Walter Johnson, leveled Carter in his own end zone for two points. And the Browns came right back again on a pass to Leroy Kelly that made it 10 to nine. The Bengals did not wither, and their strong rush caused Bill Nelson to fumble. Number 82, Royce Berry picked up the loose ball and hauled 58 yards to increase Cincinnati's lead to 17 to nine. But no lead is safe when the opponent has a Leroy Kelly at his disposal. And on this run, Leroy disposed of 55 hard-earned yards. Yards that are that tough to come by entitle a man to a short rest. Kelly's run led to a Nelson to Milt Morin touchdown that closed out the first half scoring. In the second half, Bill Nelson went to his receivers. Number 86, Gary Collins, was the key to two touchdown drives. Then a score by the ever-reliable Leroy Kelly gave the Browns a lead they never gave up. The Bengals, although outscored, were not out-hustled or out-desired. They were ready and gave it their all right to the end. A Virgil Carter pass to Speedy Thomas, number 17, made it Cleveland 30, Cincinnati 27.
And as Blanton Collier and the Browns left the field, they knew that the Tiger had claws and that this was only the beginning of what promises to be a great rivalry. You know, Tom, I remember down at the Super Bowl two years ago, the one when the Jets beat the Colts, when the announcement was first made about the new uh, conference setup and the divisions within the conference, there was a lot of skepticism about uh, what result might, uh, might come about because of it. But I think all you have to do now is to look at the fact that there are no unbeaten teams and look at the NFC where seven of the 13 teams are tied for first place. And they've achieved a balance, I think, like there's never been before in professional football. What more could you ask for than that? One of the Ram assistant coaches was saying to me, in fact, uh, last Sunday in Los Angeles, that there are no easy teams anymore. And of course, the draft has had a lot to do with it. But I think even over and above that, uh, the fact that everybody has got the same type of coaching now and the same type of scouting system has had as much to do with it as the draft of players. I can recall times when I was with the Cardinals that, that I didn't think we'd really got beat because we didn't have the talent. I thought we got outcoached and outscouted on different occasions. I don't think there'll ever be in professional football again the kind of dynasty that uh, the Browns had in the early 50s and all the way up to the Packers. I just don't think that there are that many weak teams so that one team can dominate as they did in those periods. And you know, the young players on these other clubs feel they can go out and knock off the sacred cow of the past and they just go out and lay the wood to them. That's what's happened. What's next, Pat? Well, Tom, last week, both Oakland and Kansas City showed the kind of power most people expected earlier in the AFC West. Let's look at those games right now. In Kansas City, Coach Hank Stram was looking for a way to end his team's miseries as they faced the Boston Patriots. The Super Chiefs have been inconsistent this season, sometimes flashing championship form, but rarely being able to maintain momentum. Playing without injured Lenny Dawson, the Chiefs relied on the brutal thrusts of the mini backs. Warren McVeigh, Mike Garrett, and number 45, Robert Holmes. Holmes scored both the Kansas City touchdowns as field goals accounted for the rest of the Chiefs' points. In the second quarter, a weird series of plays occurred that typify the Chiefs' early season woes. Jim Kearney, number 46, intercepted a Boston pass, but he fumbled, and the Patriots regained possession. On the very next play, it was linebacker Jim Lynch's turn to pick off a pass. This play was also canceled by a penalty. On the third play of the same series, number 42, Johnny Robinson, intercepted another one. 
After three tries, the Chiefs had finally obtained possession. And the interception, one of six, set up a field goal, giving the Chiefs a 10-3 halftime lead. In the second half, a familiar face in a new uniform entered the game for Boston and was greeted rudely by the Chiefs' defense. Number 11, Joe Cap took over at quarterback, and although he was disguised in a different uniform, the Chiefs still had his number. In the fourth quarter, John Hewitt's pass was intercepted by number 28, Art McMahon. Boston had a chance to get on the scoreboard. Boston seemed to move with a new inspiration, a new pride as the contagious, never say die spirit of Joe Cap took effect. When Ron Sellers' catch was ruled out of bounds, Cap simply pumped another to number 40, Bake Turner. Boston may have finally found their leader, but Cap's heroics were too late as the Chiefs began their climb back to the top in the AFC West with a 23-10 victory. In Oakland, the Raiders have become a physically gifted, finely tuned, well-coordinated football machine. But this year, the Raiders have had difficulty getting unwound. Oakland's hopes ride on the strong arm of Darryl LaMonica, the most valuable player in the AFL last year. LaMonica has been inconsistent this season and faced a strong challenge in the Denver Broncos. Since Lou Saban has taken over as Bronco coach, Denver has undergone a rebuilding program. The Broncos have climbed to the top in the West with talented young players like number 44, Floyd Little. The Broncos and Raiders met in Oakland, and the winless Raiders immediately displayed the form that has plummeted them to the bottom of the AFC West. Against Denver, the Raiders again appeared to be plagued by the same jinx that has made Oakland coach John Madden the most unhappy man in the league. The Broncos, on the other hand, were quick to display the talent that has propelled them to first place. As number 44, Floyd Little, barreled 54 yards to a touchdown. In the second quarter, Mike Hafner, number 84, hauled in a 28-yard shot from Pete Lisk, and it appeared the Broncos were on their way to their fourth consecutive victory. But the proud Raiders had suffered enough, and an unrelenting defense, led by number 24, Willie Brown, snuffed out the Broncos' dreams and set the stage for Oakland's rejuvenation. Darryl LaMonica, number three, shook off the losing ways and exploded for his greatest day as a professional. LaMonica completed 20 of 37 passes for 364 yards and four touchdowns. The first score went to rookie Raymond Chester, number 87. The player who was on the receiving end of three touchdowns was number 81, the man who is becoming known as Warren the Wonder. In his fifth year as a pro, Warren Wells has become the most feared long-range weapon in pro football. And paired with the bazooka-like arm of LaMonica, the Raiders' air attack is truly awesome.
LaMonica is the Babe Ruth of pro football, and with Warren Wells as his partner, the Raiders can connect for the home run at any moment. With LaMonica and Wells, it is first and goal to go from anywhere on the field. The Broncos remained in the game with field goals, but a fourth quarter bomb to Wells broke Denver's back. The Raiders won their first game of the season, 35-23, and finally unleashed the blistering long-range attack that has become their trademark. For the heartbroken Broncos and Coach Lou Saban, it was back to the practice field. And for John Madden's Oakland Raiders, it appeared that it won't be long before they are back to the top of the Western Division. We'll have more exciting action on this week in pro football right after this brief message. Although much improved over last season, neither the Steelers nor the Giants could win during the first three weeks of the season. But now they both won, and in each case, victory was sparked by individuals new to their teams this year. Although they were the darlings of the preseason, winning four out of five, the Steelers were unable to win any of their first three regular season games. Even quarterback sensation Terry Bradshaw was honing new skills. But the Steelers were obviously improved. And at home against the Buffalo Bills, they manifested that improvement into their first victory. John Fuqua, number 33, obtained from the Giants, lent credibility to a previously shoddy running attack. But the passing attack still faltered. And shortly after Al Cowling's number 82 proved it, Terry was playing his least favorite role, that of a spectator. In his place, Terry Hanratty, number five, who led the Steelers to a 10-3 lead in the second quarter, on a pass to Dave Smith, number 88. The Bills, who had knocked off the Jets the previous week, don't have O.J. Simpson for nothing, and he kept the Steelers off balance with slashing runs. Rookie quarterback Dennis Shaw, number 16, threw several long completions to Haven Moses, number 25. But they weren't able to score any touchdowns until the third quarter when Simpson cashed in on a four-yard run to tie the score at 10-all. The game was marked by several outstanding defensive plays by both teams. The Bills effectively choked off the Steelers until the fourth quarter, when a rash of interceptions betrayed them.
After Simpson's touchdown, the Bills, who had moved the ball successfully, found their offense being cracked head-on and otherwise. In the fourth quarter, Bradshaw returned to the game and thrilled the crowd with a 16-yard touchdown run that unfortunately ended five yards short of the goal line when he stepped out of bounds. So Preston Pearson, number 26, mopped up and put the Steelers comfortably ahead. Pittsburgh also got crucial help from veteran Gene Mingo, who kicked three field goals. Pittsburgh now has the people to win, and it won't be long before they do so consistently. In Yankee Stadium, the New York Giants and the Philadelphia Eagles locked horns in a duel to escape the onus of beating the league's only 0-4 team. Ron Johnson, number 30, showed that he was tired of being cast in the loser's role as he went 68 yards for a touchdown on the game's second play. Number 28, Bobby Duhon, also must have wanted to escape being a loser where he traveled 45 yards with an eagle punt for a touchdown and a 17-0 giant lead. Then it was Johnson again, as behind perfect blocking, he blazed 87 yards for an apparent touchdown. But this effort was nullified by a penalty and gave the Eagles new life. It gave new life to hard-running fullback Tom Woodishick, number 37. And new life to Harold Jackson, who caught two touchdown passes and was having a field day against the Giants' left cornerback position as the Eagles rallied to a 23-all tie. driving for a possible winning score, it was a pass that Jackson did not catch that forced the Eagles to punt and doom Philadelphia. With time running out, Giants quarterback Fran Tarkington began driving his team into field goal range. Then he called a play designed to give their kicker, Pete Gogolak, field position, but it did much more. It resulted in Johnson's 34-yard touchdown run as the Giants won their first game of the year, 30-23 and left the Eagles as the only 0-4 team in the NFL.
We'll be right back to This Week in Pro Football following station identification. This is the HSN Television Network. In the second half of our show, we'll see how Miami and Baltimore remain tied for first in the AFC East. We'll also see how Dallas and St. Louis remain tied for first in the NFC East. We'll see how the 49ers and the Redskins upset two previously undefeated teams. And in our feature called The Football Thing, we'll hear some of the fascinating sounds of football presented in a new and different way. We'll see The Football Thing, and we'll have more exciting action on this week in pro football right after this brief message. Thus far, the most predictable facet of the 1970 NFL season has been its unpredictability. The upset epidemic continued as the final unbeaten teams were crushed decisively. For Los Angeles and Detroit, defeat was ushered in by two veteran spoilers, John Brody and Sonny Jurgensen. In Washington, Redskin faithful knew success depended upon Sonny Jurgensen's whippet right arm, which so far had proved inconsistent. Sonny would have to come around against the hottest team in the NFL, the Detroit Lions. The Lions quickly demonstrated a defense which has held their opponents to a total of 17 points. In the first quarter, Larry Brown and the Washington running attack limped to the sidelines, and Jurgensen was intercepted by number 47, Wayne Rasmussen, as the potentially potent Washington attack remained under wraps. Even when the inscrutable number nine did find his way out of the haze, the results were not to be guaranteed. For the third time this season, number 42, Charlie Taylor, had a touchdown reception negated by a penalty. But the breaks were bound to even out, and so, despite the ominous start, Jurgensen simply went back to the firing line. Taylor took the ball out of a crowd and the spell was broken as the Redskins exploded out of their lethargy and through the harried Lions secondary. Twice, Jurgensen zipped touchdown strikes to Taylor. He balanced the onslaught with a seven-yarder to tight end Jerry Smith, number 87. While the offense purged itself, Washington's defense rendered helpless a Detroit attack which was minus the off-injured running back Mel Farr. With all this resurgent enthusiasm, the league's leading rusher was not about to stay hobbled on the sidelines. Larry Brown went after his first 97 yards with a passion, but he battled hardest for the final four. 
With his determined burst, Brown went over the 100-yard mark for the third time this season and finalized the Redskin resurgence. A stunning 31-10 upset over the Detroit Lions. In Los Angeles, Dick Nolan and the 49ers faced the unbeaten Rams with an infamous tradition. In 20 years of NFL play, San Francisco has yet to win a divisional title. John Brody was off to a fast start, having completed 67% of his passes. But many other optimistic San Francisco openings had been crushed on the floor of the L.A. Coliseum. The awesome Rams burst onto the field with the momentum of six straight preseason victories and three consecutive league wins. History was with Los Angeles, but the 49ers were determined to change their annual role. The usually untouchable Ram, Roman Gabriel, repeatedly felt the sincerity of San Francisco intentions. He was buffeted into his first interception of the season as number 53, Tommy Hart, gathered in the ball but made the mistake of tripping over Gabriel. Hart was called back, but his optimism mirrored a new confidence which the young 49ers feel this season. When Gabriel's passes did find their way past the line of scrimmage, 49er defensive backs took up the assault. Gabriel completed only 40% of his passes for his lowest total yardage of the season. The Rams' last bid was turned back by number 52, Skip Vanderbunt, and the potent Los Angeles powerhouse was limited to a game total of two field goals. While 77,000 Ram fans watched in disbelief at what was happening to their offense, Old pro John Brody was doing something even more unbelievable to the fierce Ram defenders. With his offensive line protecting him flawlessly from the legendary Ram rush, Brody set up and methodically peppered the Rams with middle distance passes as he controlled the ball and the game. Six times Brody hit number 18, Gene Washington, in front of the 49er secondary. All six set up the seventh. Washington cantered in gleefully as the 49ers surprisingly matched strengths with the Rams and came up a winner. For Los Angeles, however, the cruelest blow of all occurred in the first half. Brody resurrected a relic of the sand lots and loped 12 yards for the score on a quarterback draw. For once, fate seems to be smiling on the 49ers, and after two decades of frustration, San Francisco may be on the right track at last. One thing is sure for Dick Nolan, the 49ers, and John Brody. There is a new post-game feeling in San Francisco. Well, it's just a special place, just a quarterback draw. We just use it for a situation would call for it. You know, we have it, but we haven't used it, you know, until today. And it was a passing situation. We got a strong pass rush, and uh, he just took advantage of it. That was a good call. It was surprised me. We sent in a play out to Brent and Brody said, no, I have another one. And there's nobody around. Jesus just walked in. That's great. Uh, John said he was so open that he almost fell down. Uh, that's great. When he crossed that line, I don't care how he got there. He just crossed. And that's beautiful. Nothing John does surprises me. Even his, <laughs> he's got that uh, brilliant speed, you know. He just doesn't show it very much. And uh, we wanted to waste a little time, so we gave the ball to him. <laughs> I had never run it before because they, they had told me that that's a good way if we want to eat up a half for me to run that play. But uh, it, it, it worked out all right, so I had no kicks. It's got to work out. It's got to be pretty open if I'm going to run 12 yards. They're coming. I'll tell you, this is the best defense I've played with. And it's, it's just good to win. There is definitely a new feeling in San Francisco.
Well, Pat, we just watched number nine, Christian Adolph Jurgensen, working for the Redskins, and he is a super and a superior quarterback. But I've been around him through his entire 14 years in the National Football League, and he came up and used to be what we called a free spirit. Uh, he liked to go out perhaps late at night, and he loved to play football on Sunday. But now he's stabilized himself, and he's the leader of the Redskins. And we had heard going in there, Jack Whitaker and I, that he was uh, perhaps overweight and uh, not quite as quick as he used to be. So we went in to talk to him, and... And Juggy said, well, I'm down. And he, was, he said, down from 230. He's about 215 pounds. And so we wished him well and went across to the Detroit coaches and talked to Joe Schmidt and company. And they said, well, you don't throw the ball with your stomach. That he still got the fast set up in the feet and, of course, the great delivery of the ball. And in that ball game where he had three TD passes, uh, he perhaps didn't need four seconds, as the uh, pro cliche is. Maybe about 2.5, he was really fantastic. And he took him apart. He took him apart, as only the redhead can do, you know? What's coming up next, then? Well, Pat, last week both Dallas and St. Louis won to remain tied for first in the NFC East. Let's look at both of those games right now. In sunny St. Louis, the Cardinals, co-leaders with the Dallas Cowboys in the NFC's Eastern Division, met the New Orleans Saints. New Orleans quarterback Ed Hargett had difficulty all afternoon penetrating the Cardinals' deep defense. St. Louis quarterback Jim Hart has one fault that has blighted his promise for three years. He too often forces home run balls when his receivers are covered. However, this year, Hart has read zone defenses more consistently. Blessed with a brilliant receiving core led by number 81, Jackie Smith, and coupled by a brace of hard running backs, the Cardinals are pressing the mighty Dallas Cowboys. Against New Orleans, the Cardinals open the scoring with a 74-yard touchdown burst by MacArthur Lane. The Saints tied the score at seven on a power slash by Tony Baker. But St. Louis came back with a similar touchdown by Roy Shivers that gave the Cardinals a slim 17-10 lead in the fourth quarter. Behind picture-perfect protection, Hargett waited patiently until tight end Dave Parks cleared his defender, then speared him over number eight, Larry Wilson, for the tying touchdown. But Hart fired the final salvo, a 49-yard strike to Jackie Smith, who beat number 29 Gene Howard on a deep post pattern as the Cardinals maintained a share of the NFC East with their 24-17 triumph over the Saints. On Sunday, it was a short trip from the sun in St. Louis to the surf in Dallas. The Atlanta Falcons should have traded their cleats in for water wings as the monsoon season struck early and turned the Cotton Bowl into a fish bowl, where the artificial turf was magically transformed into Astro Surf. Both Falcon and Cowboy setbacks would have preferred lifeguards instead of referees because the surf was up in Dallas. Number 20, Tom McCauley, resembled Willie Mays making a mad dash for home plate and sliding safely under the tag. Usually sure-footed, Calvin Hill had a hard time adapting to the Astro Surf until he remembered his track and field days at Yale and brought the hop, step, and jump into pro football. Both quarterbacks wisely threw sparingly. Receivers looked like they were trying to catch a greased pig instead of a pigskin.
Cowboy quarterback Craig Morton was usually on target, but the elusive ball kept mystifying his receivers. Both Morton and his receivers remained stubborn. He kept right on passing, and they kept right on missing them. While the Dallas offense fell flat on its back, Coach Ernie Stautner outlined a defense that gave the Cowboys their first shutout since 1961. Linebacker Leroy Jordan, number 55, waited through blockers to shut off the run, while defensive end George Andre, number 66, showed Cannonball Butler what a wipeout means when applied to football. Finally, the Dallas offense caught up with its defense as Lance Rensel wisely used his chest, not his hands, and slid through the surf for a touchdown. Final score, Wales 13, Porpoises nothing. Last season, the New York Jets were the only strong team in the Eastern Division of the old AFL. This season, both the rejuvenated Dolphins and the transplanted Colts have taken a fast two-game lead over the Jets in the AFC East. In Houston's Astrodome, a new rival made its first appearance. Though still led by over-reliable number 19, the Colts can no longer steamroll through their schedule. For the past year, the Colts have been testing new talent like number 40, Jack Maitland, a rookie from Williams College. Maitland and former Pittsburgh receiver Roy Jefferson, number 87, gave the Colts an early two-touchdown lead over the Oilers. Houston quarterback Charlie Johnson brought the Oilers back with short passes to number 89, tight end Alvin Reed. In the third quarter, Roy Hopkins' short touchdown burst brought the Oilers to within three points. In the fourth quarter, former Dallas and Cleveland quarterback Jerry Rome, number 17, flipped a pass to number 24, Mike Richardson, which set up the go-ahead points for the Oilers. But in the end, it was old reliable John Unitas who drove the Colts 80 yards and hit five consecutive passes including the game winner to Roy Jefferson with only 46 seconds left. For the third time in four games, John Unitas had pulled a doubtful decision into the win column for the Colts, and each time a receiver named Roy Jefferson had played the key role. Last Saturday night in New York, Baltimore's former coach, Don Shula, 
led his Miami Dolphins to a first place tie with the Colts. The main ingredient in Miami's three wins has been the new passing combination of Bob Greasy to number 42, Paul Warfield, a receiver who leaves defenders stumbling after him. In all, Greasy connected with Warfield five times for 122 yards. Miami's first touchdown came as Greasy sprinted left and found who else but Paul Warfield in the end zone. Greasy also passed for a touchdown to his other wide receiver, number 81, Howard Twilley. Joe Namath was there too, and so were a few of his old favorites, like number 87, tight end Pete Lamons, who battled for every possible yard. Another Namath favorite was there, number 32, Emerson Boozer, and he too gave it all he had. But conference leading rusher Matt Snell was gone. In his place was number 34, an experienced Lee White. No Matt Snell, at least not yet. And there were others missing, Jerry Philbin, Roger Finney, and in Don Maynard's place, several rookie receivers whose inexperience had to make a difference to Namath, who threw 40 times, mostly short ones, but connected only 17 times. And the Jets never did cross Miami's goal line. New York's power was nullified. George Sauer did not catch one pass, though he came closer to a touchdown than any other member of the Jets. Three times, Namath was intercepted by the alert Dolphin defense. Once by rookie safety Jake Scott, number 13. Namath's last drive was sealed off by Dolphin cornerback Lloyd Mumford, number 26. The Dolphins had won 20 to 6 for their third win in four games. The Jets had lost their third in four games, and for the Jets, the roughest part of their schedule is yet to come. This Week in Pro Football has been brought to you by American Motors and your local American Motors dealer. By Hager Slacks. They just fit better naturally. Promotional consideration is provided by American Motors, makers of the bold new 1971 Javelin, with styling so hairy we even risk turning some people off. Javelin by American Motors. This has been a color feature presentation in cooperation with NFL Films through the facilities of Hughes Sports Network.